Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It's a regularly scheduled meeting of the Sunderland Select Board. It's January 30th. It's uh, 3.38. We've had some technical difficulties, but we're uh, um, coming up now. Uh, agenda, we have uh, some, we have members of the Finance Committee with us this evening. We also have Director of the EMS and our Director of the South County Senior Center. And we're going to have a poll hearing tonight. Crystal loves those. Uh, so, first order of business is uh, minutes approval of January 17th. I motion we accept the minutes of January 17th. Seconded. We have a motion made and seconded to accept the minutes of January 17th as presented. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Jeff, 3 0. Next up is uh, I'd like to call the order of 6 30 p.m. poll hearing for Hadley Road and Eversource is going to come in and talk about their poll hearing. Eversource? Hello, uh, my name is Dan Meager. I'm a president for Eversource. Uh, did Mike send anything over for you guys to look at at least to see what's going on? Uh, he yeah, we have the poll the petition with the... Yeah. Like the this? Well, he, he, he sent over some drawings just to, if you want to see it. If not, I'll hang on to it. So, so you, you, you intend on going down Ferry Road, right? Correct. So essentially what's happening is the uh, two lines that are running down Ferry Road are too small for the, the up-and-coming load that's required on it. Yep. So we need to increase those. So, so you're, 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 you're actually looking first for moving the pole along 47 slash Hadley Road. Yeah, it's about 10 feet to make it more center with Ferry Street. Okay. Two cables down the center of Ferry Street, and then put down. We're gonna put in four manholes in conjunction with that. Okay. So, so then you're 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 coming down the the, the center line of the present dirt road, Ferry Road, right? Correct. So, do you have a, a construction length on that? How long it's going to take? That I do not have. I, I because just uh, we have farmers in that area that do utilize that, so I don't know when you're planning on starting that work. That I'm not getting, so I'm unfortunately here to represent Mike, and I did not have a start date. Um, I know there's going to be a moratorium on digging. So When's that? I know there's going to be a moratorium on digging and, and, and the road stuff, so I don't even know if we're going to do it until spring. Okay. But if that is an answer I can get for you, I certainly will. Yeah, I think that's important. I, I mean, I, I just want to, I, and you don't have a, a length of project, right? I'm sorry? You don't have a length of the project? Time frame, though. No. So, are, so are, are you are you guys self performing? Are you self performing the work? We're we'll doing the work, yeah. So, so you you're going to use your backhoe or your mini X or whatever to run down the road. Worst case, we probably hire um, Carl's to do the work. Yeah. Yep. And you're going down 18, 24 inches. It's like it's it might be a little bit deeper, two feet at most. We got to be right below the frost line, so right almost four feet. Okay, and. I, I'm just a little concerned because it is a it is a a gravel gravel road. Yep. So we just want to maintain you know we just want to maintain what we have. Yes. Yeah, so we will return all of the roads to the condition that is required by your town. So nothing will be disrupted in a way that you would be happy with. Nothing is going to be done by current DPW standards. So the manholes are are the manholes existing, pre existing? They're not. They're and 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 are you just gonna put down concrete? Are they yeah. concrete manholes? They are eight by eight? No, they're bigger than that. Uh, six by fourteen by seven. Pre wow. Yeah. Pre precast? Precast concrete. All right, so not cast in place, precast. You're gonna have one manhole going, you know, one, one, uh, Four. yeah, the, the manholes themselves, but the entrance into the manholes, uh, it's gonna be like eight conduit, I think, in and then back out. Oh, well, one, one manhole itself, you five on the top, yeah, yes, just one, one per structure. You could have H20 rated covers, everything will be, we've got for standard. You're not going to be like Baltazar and leave them low to become um, bumps in the road? That's not the plan. 
Well, just every time I'm reminded of it as I'm going up North Sunderland once a day or going north, I have a nice bump to go. I've been wanted to put a sign, pothole brought to you by the, forget it, just get in trouble for something like that. Um, now, are the you, you're just putting, what are you, what are you using, two inch conduit in the ground? That'll be uh, five inch. And it says two five-inch conduits to each pole. Six five-inch. And you're putting and you're and you're putting bank of six down. Two three. Ah, that's fine. Uh, two, I was looking at this up here. Five-inch five conduits. That's up to the pole. Okay. All right, Crystal. What's going down there now? Uh, this, there's no. Uh, it's just it's just cable. It's actually along the side of the road. One, one's down the center, and one's along the side of the ferry road. But due to the size of the cable and the length of the cable, we can't just pull in one full length. Uh, yeah. We don't have the type of equipment to do that, so that's why we have the four manuals. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm familiar with that. I'm just wondering what's existing there now is just a direct buried. I believe it is. Yeah. You guys are brave. You guys are brave because we have had... We have had farmers decided that they didn't want to lift their plows going across the road. So, good thing our frost line is so so low. <laughs> yeah. And then they denied that they did it. And it was like, <laughs> wait a second. <laughs> uh, well, I'll okay. be okay now. I don't think they've dug it up yet. That's what I was just saying. Eight. I would definitely go. You know, I, I, you have to be by frost line, do the frost seeds and things like that. So it's be four feet oh, you're gonna go four feet then? Sure. Yeah. Wow. And because Deeper it's than... in a row, it's all going to be in concrete. All right. Nathaniel, questions? No, nope, I'm good. So, so Jeff, um, I, I would, my, my concerns would that be that it's going to be done in conjunction with, especially across in 47, that it be done in conjunction with the uh, oversight of our town highway yep. super. Um, but, as far as the digging going down, down Ferry Road, um, I, I know it's going to be difficult, but you're going to have to somehow it's going to have to be coordinated with with uh, the landowners because they 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 need that to get you know their their equipment in and out, especially during planting season. So, yep. Think of anything else. Oh, I think we probably have some of butters here that might yeah. want to speak, but no, I'm good. Cool. Nathaniel, I'm good. All right. Any other questions of the of the uh, petitioner? No. Nope. So you wouldn't have a problem with us talking about uh, making uh, the okay contingent upon working with uh, the highway super? Would you? I don't see that being a problem. All right. I'll, I'll pass on the mic that you need to. So if there's any abutters here, would you uh, want to offer them like free electricity for their support? I'm trying, guys. I'm, like I'm, I'm trying. But <laughs> well, what, what are the pink flags that are on our lot? In our yards. Pink flags? Yeah. Probably dig safe, right? Hmm? Dig safe? Most likely they're dig safe. Well, the, the only thing about dig safe, okay? Dig safe notifies member utilities. Say, so what does that mean, Tom? What does if, that mean, Tommy? If you're not, if you, if the like the town of Sunderland Water Department is not a member utility. So if you have town, well, they are now through the town of Sunderland because the town of Sunderland wasn't a member utility. So there's a fee to become a member utility. It's like a $175 or something like that a year. So, so if you put in Eversource is a member utility. So they, if you call DigSafe 811, Eversource would, they contract out their DigSafe, they would come and mark out their utilities. But if you have, if you're, 
if you're not a member of utilities, they don't know about it and they don't they don't notify you. So we, it's just a survey. Okay. If you saw orange would be electric, blue gas, and so on and so forth. So red, yeah. Or red electric. Red red for electricity, yellow for steam and gas, green for water, sewer. Oh yeah. All right. So other neighbors that would like to talk? Or have any questions? I try to get free electricity. That didn't work. <laughs> Sorry. That was pretty much our only question, really. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or, or maybe like two and a half cents per kilowatt. Going up in that area? No, it'll just be that one pole that's being moved. Like I said, it's only about 10 feet to get more in line with the fairness okay. street. That's it. Okay. Are you able to put the sewer system in the Are you able to put the the little map they gave us up on the screen? No? Actually, yeah. Not necessarily for people at home, but just so that the abutters, if they'd like to see where the, the plan is going, I think it'd be, if we can make that happen, that'd be good. So so basically what they want to do now, they just want to go right down the middle of Ferry Road with the line. And they want to move the pole that's down, they want to move it 10 feet to the southern, southernly direction. I'm over here making things complicated for you, sorry. Yeah, but the dig safe stuff is pretty interesting. I, I, I'd always assume that they just notified everybody. So what you're saying is all I have to do is pay $175 and I can be notified about all the big safe stuff. That sounds lovely. At one point in my career, I actually marked out dig safes. That sounds fun. <laughs> it was a joy. And you're going to need to rotate it three times when you get to the bottom. You guys can see the poles just up the street a little bit, maybe move down the street, and then they're going to go underground under the road, and then underground conduit down the ferry street. Same, same height? Pole, same height? Yeah, that won't change. And less by some chances, a rather small pole. Yeah, because before you were going to what, to 45 feet? When they were going from 40 to 45 or something? 35 to 40, sorry. Something. Yeah, a 45 foot class one. Yeah. So you got 45 down there now? All right. Okay, any other questions? Okay. Any questions from me? I'm good. So, so at this point, I'd like to uh, close the hearing of hearing no more questions. All right, so Jeff closed the hearing at uh, 6.53. Now we start our technical deliberations. What do you want to, what do you, what do you think, guys? I'm fine with what you were suggesting, having it be contingent on having the DPW be involved. And contingent and on a time frame that it doesn't upset the farming. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, with those two stipulations, I've got no problem moving forward with it. So, so we're going to vote conting uh, contingent, contingent about, there's a couple things. First thing is that all work be inspected, uh, you know, proper notif proper notification be given to the highway su superintendent so that uh, all work can be inspected um, and, and okay um, that the work is scheduled with the uh, abutting uh, landowners so not as to not to uh, uh, interfere with their uh, harvest schedule. I don't think there's any asparagus down there, but there is, I'm sure they'll be putting. No, but you guys, somebody will need to plant down there at some point and well, till. Yeah, and cor yeah corn, farm. and what's that? Atlas Farm does all that land behind there now. Oh, so they may be putting lettuce and stuff down there, huh? A lot of lettuce. So they'll, they'll be out there early, so, yeah. so we'll, Jeff, um, 
make sure that Eversource contacts you, contact, contacts the town with a uh, construction schedule, okay? I'm sure they can work. I used to hold that field. Cucumbers. It's a long way to that river, isn't it? Yeah. And Walter would, uh, all right. All right, I'll entertain a motion. So I, I make a motion we grant the, the poll hearing contingent upon the two mentioned. Okay. Seconded. Okay, we have a motion made and seconded to grant the uh, poll hearing application from Eversource contingent upon compliance with the items that we've listed. Um, one is that all work be uh, are reviewed and authorized by the highway superintendent and the local landowners are, are consulted to uh, work around their, their schedule for planting and access to their fields. Because it is a road. Okay. Hearing no other discussion, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Thanks for showing up tonight, Eversource. Thank you also for coming. Appreciate it. Try it. All right, next up, we're going to talk about uh, budget presentations from South County EMS first. Zoe? Thanks, Tom. Uh, for those in the audience, you heard Tom refer to me as Zoe. That is my uh, new first name, so uh, that's very exciting for me. Um, and uh, the budget was uh, disseminated. This was approved by the South County Board of Oversight, uh, which is comprised of two representatives from each of the three member towns. So as a quick primer for anybody in the room or out in TV land who doesn't know, South County EMS is, a, is your EMS agency. We're a municipal department, and we're the first and only of its kind in the Commonwealth. So we are truly regional. We, we have a board of oversight. Um, and all of the employees of South County EMS are uh, employed by the three member towns. We're technically town of Deerfield employees. But, um, and part of this vision was to get the three towns together, regionalize, combine our resources, but then also hold ourselves accountable for what the real cost of service is. So we have something that's called an enterprise fund, and that basically means that all of our expenses are shown as part of that enterprise fund, and we pay out of that enterprise fund, and then all receipts that we get back from billing insurance goes back into the enterprise fund. So in that way, we are able to offset the costs um, of our operations. Uh, and also, you'll notice that there are things on our budget that we are taking responsibility for, like employee benefits or other post-employment benefits, OPEB, um, that would typically get lost amongst other accounts in a regular municipal department. So that's kind of the 30,000 foot view. Um, we are staffed 24-7 with one paramedic level ambulance. That is the gold standard level of care. Uh, with two paramedics. A paramedic goes to school for about three years um, to get to that level of training. And then we add additional staffing during the day. So a uh, second ambulance, uh, 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. That's typically our busiest hours uh, for the makeup of our community since we have so much industry in town and people passing through. Our call volume goes up during the day. Um, those. Uh, those salaries plus the employee benefits, as I said, that we're showing responsibility for that. Uh, the town of Deerfield is a fiduciary, so we go by town of Deerfield benefiting, so those numbers are provided to us by the town of Deerfield. Um, I'm still waiting for some updated numbers on those, but these are based on our calculation, like calculators and those estimates, um, and I I'm, feel pretty comfortable with probably around that ballpark. And then we add operating expenses, and so this is band-aids, this is oxygen. Um, and this is the type of thing where as call volume goes up, we're going to have to buy more of those things. And certainly we've seen an impact here um, just with inflation because you know, the, the cost of a band-aid goes up, the cost of oxygen goes up. It's just the cost of doing business. We can't cut costs um, in, in those things. Those are, that's medical equipment. Um, and I, I should go back on salaries. So because we're trying to do for employees, the personnel committee in Deerfield reviews our classification compensation scale. They make recommendations on COLAs, things like that. And it is customary for 
uh, our department and all Deerfield employees that in their respective grade, they go up a step every year. So that is representative of the additional expertise and experience they have. It comes with it a pay raise to reflect that and also that incentive for them to remain that brain trust and so we're not um, losing people. And then the personnel committee also voted for a 3% COLA. So all the employees are getting a step and then to make up for the cost of living adjustment, they're gonna get an additional 3%. That's what those numbers are represented here, um, and that is up to the town here for the negotiations. Joey, one question. How, how many steps are, are there? Uh, on the last class comp, I believe it went up to 12. They just did, the town of Deerfield re, does a restudy every seven to 10 years, um, and because it was getting pushed out close to 10, our old one was 10 steps. They did a 12 step study to buy them a couple extra years of wiggle room there. Um, and. The idea of that is a brand new employee with no experience, you start with step one and you go up a step every year. And so you get about a step five, step six, they redo the class comp and they say, what would a starting employee get in today's market compared to comparable tasks? And the effect that that has is it basically slides the whole scale up so that starting pay. And so that employee what, that was at a step six, we'll say, gets reset to a step two on the new scale they don't get a pay cut because the scale's new, and basically their career ladder just kind of keeps going in front of them, and then they kind of close in towards the end, and it goes up again. So 12 steps on the Deerfield class comp. Well, no, I like, Joey, I liked your explanation about how, how the steps, because I was wondering, because like sometimes we talk with a, in a teacher's contract, the teachers max out on steps, or, and so they, I don't think they re, so, the Deerfield example is a little, is a little different than mm -hmm. what most of us are are used to. Yeah, and the step one is consider a brand new employee that you're bringing them on board. So sometimes we will need to recruit, you know, in our early days of South County, we had to recruit some experienced paramedics um, because you need some experience there. Um, and, uh, you know, we've got, if you can bring somebody in, you know, up to a step three with consideration from the personnel committee. So every once in a while, somebody might start a little bit higher, um, but we always try to keep them kind of in the middle of, the, of that range with the uh, re-evaluations. Okay. Thank you, Joey. Um, and then, let's see, yeah. So uh, this budget is, is complicated. It doesn't really look like things that are people are normally used to, but the, the personnel costs and the operating expenses, in order to, to provide that basically one and a third ambulances 24 seven at the paramedic level and provide the services that we do, it is budgeted to cost $1.5 million in 2024. That's everything. So that's like 30% on top of salaries for benefits and all that. That's what it costs to, to put that together. Um, but because we're an enterprise fund, we get to have some fun with it. So we know that we are going to receive some revenue from billing. Uh, and we, we don't go after people as far as like um, collections agencies or things like that. This is like you have insurance, you've been paying for insurance, let's use them and have them pay that insurance out like they're supposed to, right? So we build that out and we're actually seeing an increase in billing revenue expectations for the upcoming year. Um, Medicare, Medicaid just got their reimbursement rates increased by 6.6%. Um, they represent a percentage of our total billing, so we're not gonna see a 6.6% increase, but we're probably gonna see a high twos, low 3% increase, hopefully. Um, also, you build a good service and your call volume goes up, the communities are aging, just ambulance call volume is going up, so we expect an increase in, in call volume, which will then result in more billing revenue. Um, and so the estimation of, we call it medical service fees, um, we've increased from last year up to $625,000. So it's gonna cost us 1.5 million, but right off the bat, we expect that we're gonna get $625,000 in revenue for those services. So we can subtract that from the money that we're gonna have to raise. The next number is because I said we we're, we're an enterprise fund, that that money rolls over and helps fund us. So when we don't spend a full line item in a previous year, um, just like free cash on a town level, our certified retained earnings remain with us. So you can think of it like 
if we budget $1,000 for computer repair and we only spend 500, that remaining 500 is going to travel with us into the new year. And I like to think of it as kind of offsetting that line item itself. And so it kind of comes out as a, a net zero as far as trying to budget. But the certified retained earnings that we had from the previous year is another $284,554. So together, the retained earnings plus the billing revenue comes out to $909,000 um, and a half. And so we subtract that from that $1.5 million. And the difference is what we are going to have to come up through taxation. And that is $680,000 and, excuse me, $680,628. So that is the cost to the three towns that they will need to pay for this service. Um, this is usually the point at which somebody brings up, or they're thinking, well, ambulances are for profit, they're supposed to fund themselves. And I'd like to point out that there are two very distinct business models that use ambulances. One is emergency medical response, that's what we do, it's like a fire department, that's a police department. You pay ahead of time to have a service that you can provide to the community. The other one is medical specialty transport, and that is the other thing that uses ambulances. Those are like your hospital discharges, your dialysis runs, and they negotiate contracts ahead of time, and they're a very different business model. Those are your for-profit business models with negotiated contracts, um, and we are a public safety agency. So that's where that difference comes. Um, and then that 680,000 that we need to come up with taxation, we assess to the three member towns. And this is based on a formula well established back in our creation almost 10 years ago. Um, and it's based on total property values and population um, as they are respect to the full three towns. And I could bore you with the math, um, but basically Sunderland's share of that, um, of the total assessment is 31 point for 7%. So 31.47% of 680,000 is $214,239. So for a $1.5 million 24 seven paramedic service, Sunderland um, is being asked to pay 214,239. Um, and that is an increase of $4,000 over the last year. Um, um, and so, so um, South County EMS Board of Oversight had a meeting last week, and a couple residents of the town of Deerfield had made a comment about Sunderland, Sunderland not, um, every, the comment was, well, everybody knows that Sunderland has more ambulance runs than what they pay for and I go yeah I don't think that's true um, and the Board of Oversight at every one of our meetings we get all, all kinds of information in nauseam sometimes so we and <laughs> but one of them is they talk about um, numbers and and typically over the years and, and and we have two we have two types of calls. We have calls to three communities, Sunland, Deerfield, Whiteley, and then we have calls that we we make mutual aid or inter what they call intercepts. So I just used numbers of calls to the three communities. Sunland has averaged approximately. Um, 26 27 percent of the call volume and Deerfield has been running about 55 50 56 percent of the call volumes so town of Sunderland is not could change next year we're, we're actually we're actually uh, the graciousness of the town of Sunderland's heart we're paying for town of Deerfield I'd like to say that because um, it, it bothers it, it bothers me because when we first started the thing, and this is this is what I think is amazing about the program and about Ted Baxter, the guy that did the first studies. We sat down and 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 Zoe was talking about the formula, and 
we knew that we just couldn't say purely on run volume. That wouldn't be fair. We couldn't re really just do it by um, population because that may or may not be fair. And we didn't. We couldn't do it by town valuation because that that wasn't fair. Um, but what we did do is is uh, we use a system that combined a lot of different items to try to come out with a, and this is my problem, equal and fair. I'd rather be fair much more than equal because sometimes equal isn't the, I think fair is better than equal. That being said, and we came out with this formula, and actually this formula has worked really, really well over the years. And, and for the town of Sun, we've been paying a little bit more maybe than the number of volume call, call volumes has, ex, has expressed. But on the whole, um, f for a 1.5, I mean, a yeah, $1.5 million service, and we get a sub, approximately seven minute response, that's pretty good. So I, I, I'm not going to complain about that. But I would like, Zoe, if you could explain a little bit more, because we, over in the Board of Oversight, we get concerned residents at times that talk about um, the money that we don't collect. So could you, could you just talk about that for a sure. second, Zoe? That's a great question. Um, medical billing, and certainly emergency medical billing, has been a real education for me uh, since I took this job. And Basically, you know, the, in order to abide by the law and not be committing fraud, we bill everybody the same amount, irrespective of what insurance they have, whether they're on the public trust, whether they have fancy Cadillac insurance, they get the same bill because that is the cost for us to provide that service. Then what happens is, so that is the amount that we bill, and then we have an amount of expected revenue and that is because things like the federal government can say that's cute but our medicare patients we know it costs you twelve hundred dollars to do this call we are only going to write you a check for three hundred um, and it being medicare it being the federal government we say thank you uncle sam and we take our three hundred dollars and we the the remainder of that eventually gets written off that is money that we never expect to receive and so Typically, when you're billing in these emergency cases, you have billing, uh, the amounts that you've billed and the amount that you expect to collect. And you measure yourself against the amount that you expect to collect, because that is representative of how well you're gathering insurance information, your timeliness of your um, claims into the insurance company and things like that. When we measure ourselves against that, South County EMS is exceptionally good on our returns. When it comes to private insurance, we get upwards of 97% uh, of, um, of the money that we expect to receive. Um, and the remainder of that um, is usually your like $50 co-pays, the people are out of town, they get a bill for $50 from, you know, bucolic uh, Western Massachusetts, and, and they go, okay, I'm never gonna pay that. Um, the other portion, uh, Medicare, Medicaid, uninsured patients, those are our larger percentage of like um, non-collected amounts, and we're in the mid 80% format. Um, again, you're gonna have to take my word on this. It took me a while to kind of like chew on all this, but that is still also exceptional. Um, usually what happens is, depending on your demographics, they say if you're getting like 60s to 70% on returns, you should be patting yourself on the back, you're doing something well. So the fact that we're like 80s for uninsured Medicare, Medicaid, and high 90s for self, or excuse me, for private insurance is really good. So that's how we measure our success. Um, you will hear, uh, if you pay attention to the Deerfield Select Board meetings, that we do regular write-offs um, for outstanding balances. What we're writing off are those monies that we never expected to collect in the first place. So it's unique because we are required to bill everybody even though we know that Medicare won't pay it. Um, but that's how we do that legally. If this was you know, the private field, you'd say, why are you writing off money or doing something wrong? But it's actually uh, an example of, of us doing things uh, smartly and correctly. And, and we use a 
independent billing company. Um, they're based in Massachusetts. They're specialists in this type of thing. There's also like medical billing coding and all that. Um, and they report back to us on a regular basis and have flags set up. So if for some reason our billing revenue starts to drop off, they can see that kind of ahead of time. They can trend that and be like, you know, we think there's something wrong in the process here. Maybe the data's not getting transferred over, but um, we've never tripped any of those flags. And, um, and so I think that's, um, that's part of the reason why so much of our service can be funded through that revenue. Thanks, Roy. Um, any questions uh, on the operating budget, anything like that? I have a couple, if you don't mind. Yes, please. Oh, I love talking about this stuff. <laughs> um, I think and speak in spreadsheets, so I, know. Yeah. I appreciate the detail. Um, I just a kind of point of clarification. You spoke earlier about the salary and wages. Yeah. Um, it sounds like the, I mean, considerable increase, and it sounds like it's a blend of both COLAs, mm -hmm. um, but also step steps yep. up. Um, how much of the increases, so like full-time staff, full-time overtime, are pretty considerable increases, are those uh, mostly step-ups or are they headcount additions? Um, great question. So the overtime I'm going to talk about in a second just because that number actually represents two things there that are, we'll get there in a second. Um, so full-time staff, we hired two additional full-timers last year as a way to combat overtime. Um, and uh, get more reliable staffing. We weren't scrambling um, when somebody calls out. So we actually were able to reduce our call staff numbers because of that addition of the full-time staff members. Mm -hmm. And then coming into this new fiscal year, we realized that the, we were doing a little of robbing Peter to pay Paul with the full-time staff. We were double counting them. So they were providing that second ambulance during the week when, um, when everybody was at, on duty. And then if somebody called out sick or was on vacation or things like that, the other full-time and back fell into that A1, that first ambulance slot, and it left A2 unstaffed. And so we went into 2023 saying, okay, we're a one ambulance, 24-hour service. Let's go with that. And we addressed all those concerns we thought it was going to address, and then it ended up giving us the problem where that second ambulance wasn't reliably staffed. So those additional things that like Tom was talking about, those intercepts, which are responses to other towns that we build a town for. We actually don't build a patient on that, we build a town for that, which is like great, it's like easy money, that's like 100% collection. Um, those things, um, if we're paying for staff to be in the seat anyway, that's free money more or less to be able to do that. And so the increase in the call staff line item here is to pay for the backfill of the full-time staff on that second truck. So we're basically backfilling backfill in order to maintain um, consistency there and send to our neighbors and our peers that like we are available for this. You can call us and it also means that we are we are really the ones benefiting from it because it means that we, we can assure that that second truck is going to be available during the day. Um, whereas in 2023, it was kind of like, maybe I'll have to check the schedule or something like that. So that's why you see an increase in the call staff um, as far as like a big chunk of that. The other thing too is COLA increases um, affect call staff as well uh, because of rising tide. Sure. Um, so, so there's a little bit of both of those things. The overtime hours, um, the way that the town of Deerfield's personnel bylaws work, holidays are to be paid as a at their regular rate, and that is like all of that's the like that's the totality of what the bylaws speaks to um, holidays, which means that our full time staff. If they work a week, say, um, New Year's Day, and they've got eight hours of holiday that week, if they physically work their full 40, they get, they work 40, they get paid for 48, so eight hours of overtime. Um, and that is, that is like a highly effective standard way of approaching that because they could take those eight hours off, but then I've got to find somebody to work. And a per diem doesn't want to work it because they got to be paid at a regular rate, not at a holiday rate. 
um, and you just got compounding problems and you end up paying somebody else full time to backfill this person and they can get full so, sure. anyway. Um, so 70,000, uh, excuse me, 50,000 of that overtime line item is actually holiday pay. The actual overtime hours worked about is $70,838. And across 10 employees, that works out to just over two hours a week of overtime or eight hours a month. And that represents either you know being held over on a late call, the shift's over at three, the call comes in at two, it takes two and a half hours to do that call so they get paid the two hours of overtime, or um, they need to come in early or leave late for chart review, uh, something comes up. Or eight hours a month of, they were on a 16, their relief called out, do you want to stay for another eight, and that type of thing. And so that actual overtime amount is well within our abilities to manage. It gives a little bit of incentive for employees who want to step up and work a little bit extra, um, but we're not flirting with employee burnout or anything like that. It's not mandated over time the way some of the departments approach it. Is that a change in policy year over year? I mean, fifty thousand dollars. Uh, the the overtime thing? Yeah. No, that's the same. That's the same policy that we were having before. We tried to. So we added. We went from eight to ten full-time employees. Okay. So we added twenty percent. Okay. That makes um, sense. Though. And so we added twenty percent. We're adding staffing, um, and the cola also. It's going to bring up, sure. you know, their overtime rates, their steps as well. And my other question is the uh, retained earnings line item. Is that a cumulative number year over year? So uh, the uh, two eighty four essentially represents all cumulative rollovers until you spend it. Yeah. Uh, so yeah. Just kind of this up and down. Yeah, and our and so we'll get to the capital budget in a second. It's very short, very sweet. Um, but the idea has always been that you know we've got this retained earnings come in. We anticipate X number in billing revenue, anything above and beyond that, revenue above expectations, we've always put aside for large capital replacements, particularly an ambulance. So we know we need to replace an ambulance every four to five years. We divide the cost by four, and if we can yeah, chisel sure. that off and put the rest um, to lowering the assessment. Um, because we're an enterprise fund and we can't actually create a capital stabilization fund for legal reasons or something like that, that, that retained earnings amount every year gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger and people start hyperventilating and then we spend it, we buy an ambulance for yeah, $300,000 and we never can take a sign. So yeah, and so that number going up and down is like, you know, depends on, well, I should say that retained earnings number is the number that we apply to the budget. I've got a separate spreadsheet. So that's what I was yeah. saying. Yeah. Is this a, an account balance or is it the amount that you're using for this year? That, that is the amount we are using um, for this year. So we gotcha. actually have we actually have three hundred and ninety-two thousand and fifty-four dollars okay. in re certified retained earnings. That's what I Yeah, okay. Cool. We're speaking the same one. Right. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um anything else? Thanks for uh, oh, I love this stuff. Yeah, thanks for taking <laughs> my questions. Um, so I, I did. I mean, I, I teased at the the capital budget um, separately. Any other questions on uh, the operating budget? Um, so we normally, as I said, we normally try to fund the ambulance replacement at retained earnings. It's super clean. It's super sweet. We know it's going to cost two hundred sixty thousand dollars. We know we need to replace one every forty or four years, so we put sixty-three thousand dollars a year away. And then every four years, you go to the town. We say we got to make a big purchase. We've got the money on hand, so we need to rubber stamp it. Turns out, in the past eight months, that ambulance cost has gone from two hundred and sixty thousand to like three hundred and sixty thousand um, dollars. Yeah, big big swallow there. The other thing is that ambulance replacement is over 700 days out on um, last glean, so we're allowed to order it when the money is voted on at town meeting. If I call the following day, that's when the clock starts, so 700 days, so we're like well into you know, future fiscal years at that point, and opportunities to find more funding too in the meantime. Um, and we've had some necessary expenses also uh, 
I, I should say, not unanticipated capital expenses, but prematurely occurring capital expenses. So most notably are cardiac monitors. They're a $50,000 piece of equipment, and that is like what allows a paramedic to read your EKG, administer electricity, tell that you're having a, um, a heart attack, treat your heart attack, bring you to the, directly to the cath lab, all that stuff. So we purchased our monitors in 2012 under a grant, and the estimated, uh, no, I'm sorry, 2014 under the grant. And the estimation on that Lowe's life, uh, lifetime is 10 years. So we were expecting, okay, we're, gonna, we're, we're hunting for grant solutions right now. Actually, we've got a bunch of grant applications in to replace these monitors. And we were thinking in, okay, 2004 fiscal year, you know, whatever that works out to. Um, fiscal year 2004, excuse me, so 2004. Fiscal year 2005. It turns out, though, that these monitors are of an early generation, and they are actually, we've been told by the manufacturer that they are non-repairable. So the circuit board that is in them came from a previous manufacturer and had some sort of dangerous chemical in the manufacturing process. And so they've gone to a different vendor, but it means that those circuit boards are no longer available. So that means that if and when one of these monitors fail, we have two currently in our fleet, that um, we will be without a cardiac monitor. Um, dropping from two paramedic trucks down to one, right? And so we'd really be kicking ourselves in the, in the shin. So the Board of Oversight at the last meeting said, well, we have certified retained earnings available to us now. The turnaround time on those monitors could be over a year. Um, so the, the Board of Oversight voted, we need to order these monitors right now. Let's get replacements ordered on the list and and get them in, and we have the money on hand. So we are buying the replacement cardiac monitors out of certified retained earnings. Um, but that means that we're like that much less, or that much more short for the ambulance replacement that we were anticipating in FY24 to be fully funded for. So on the capital expense sheet, this was also decided by the Board of Oversight as a way of presenting this to the three member towns. That ambulance is estimated at $375,000. That is a quote for the exact same model that we paid $363,000 for not too long ago. We have $100,000 left of retained earnings that we can apply to that. So that means that we're $275,000 short. And if we apply the same percentage makeup to the three member towns, um, that means Deerfield's share of this capital purchase would be 142. Sunderland, 86,000, and Wakeley, 46. And the thought was, you know what, let's put it to the three member towns and see if this is a project they would like to fund, and if so, let them decide where they would like that money to come from. I know Deerfield has capital stabilization and free cash, and they may decide to make that purchase out of that. This purchase also, like I said, we're going for grant money. Um, we are in a good position for an unlikely grant. So. We are not likely to get this grant, but if anybody's going to get the grant, we're, we could be it. Um, but it doesn't mean that we shouldn't go after this right now, and, and we certainly can't count on that great money. So if all three towns at town meeting vote to approve this capital expenditure, then we will have the money and be able to spend it. If one of the towns decides, you know what, this, this just isn't a virtue that we want, um, then we would be short and we wouldn't be able to fund it unless we came up with a different funding stream. But that is what this capital request represents, is that we need this ambulance. Um, it would be replacing, ambulances are supposed to be about 10 years old. Um, we were pushing our third line ambulance out to 12 just because of the amount of um, use that third truck gets. Um, it usually is like football game standbys. I don't know if you watched the news recently. Um, the current truck, I believe, is going on 17 years old. And it's costing over $6 a mile to keep in service as far as maintenance compared to two for the other trucks. And we're looking at some cost prohibitive um, repairs that will probably just mean it'll, it'll be more cost effective to take it out of service completely, um, which would have a, a negative impact on our level of service. So it's definitely imperative that we get this truck replaced as soon as we can. Um, it's just a matter of whether um, the towns feel they're in a position to be able to um, help pay for it.
nets the capital. But any questions on the capital budget? Can I ask a question about both? Please. Okay. So, 284000 in retained earnings is going to the operating budget this year. Yes. Potentially, we're spending down all our retained earnings. So, how are we going to pay for the $284,000 in next year's budget that we don't have anymore? We would, we are... We would still accumulate retained earnings. By the time budget season comes around again, we will have all of the receipts from our current fiscal year. So this money gets certified in the fall. All of another 12 months worth of um, billing revenue. So there would be that difference. And whatever we don't spend out of the current fiscal year. So if we're left with a balance in our enterprise fund from our operating budget, because we don't zero out every line item, that also goes towards retained earnings. So you're confident that next year you would have enough to do something similar? I, we've been pretty consistent, right around $200,000. I think you can see the trending here um, of retained earnings. 284, 204, 231, 299. I, we're always kind of around that. And that is representative of, like, of all those things working together. If we had another COVID and our call volume decreased and our billing revenue decreased, or we had another huge spike of inflation, and like, you know, I mean, yeah. all those things are going to come into play. Um, but, but I would anticipate. I mean, we're trying to keep it relatively consistent for everybody. So, are the what generally generates the retained? So, two sounds like. Your retained earnings comes from two sources. Yeah. Either you underestimated your revenues. Correct. Or yeah. you overestimated your expenses and you spent under. Nailed it. Which ones do you usually play with? Because we're playing with numbers here. <laughs> um, estimated revenues. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, so, so you're kind of lowballing your service fees. Yeah, because I want to make sure that if we're relying on the, that revenue to fund our budget, I want to be you're conservative concerned. on that. And okay. certainly when we hit COVID, I, we. So, I mean, yes, everybody was getting sick, but nobody wanted to go to the hospital because that's where all the sick people are, right? And so our call volume decreased and our billing revenue decreased as a result. Sure. I can't get cute with the budget. I, like, I don't like doing that. I'm just like, this is the number I, I, you know, I worked on, I came up with. I never, like, I never put any padding in these numbers as a way for us to like, feel good about ourselves. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we're playing with the estimated revenue. Right. That said, <laughs> whenever you forecast, you'll never be 100% accurate. So you can call it playing or sure, you're, you're, yes, you're doing yeah. your best. Yes, from one spreadsheet <laughs> person to another. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Just out of curiosity, um, how did you decide on the split for the, the free cash or whatever you call it? The 100,000 and the 200 and whatever? Uh, that is. Uh, that is done at the Board of Oversight level, and it's definitely, I usually start with, here's our retained earnings, here's what we've earmarked and put aside for ambulance replacement or other capital expenditures, and then this is the number left over. So after we've spent out of retained earnings to fund these capital purchases, this is what we have left. Um, then I plug that number into the budget. And then we have our debate about, do we need to buy uh, monitors, do we want to try to fund the ambulance more or less, do we go to the towns and say, that's where we start really getting in the nitty gritty about how do we want to apply the retained earnings. And sometimes it just comes down to, as well, that left a nice round $100,000 to put towards the ambulance replacement, um, and it kept the current budget relatively level, and it allowed us to purchase the cardiac monitors immediately. And so a little of this is happy accident. Sometimes there's a little bit like, man, if we could get that number to 2.4 and not 2.6, you know, this would be an easier sell type thing and, and then trying to like figure out how to manage those things. That makes sense. It just seems that with, with, with the capital request and the budget, it, it's one or the other. I mean, you know, <laughs> you're taking money from one, but another, it, it, it's, it's gonna cost the town the same amount either way. It's just a question of whether or not you wanna come and say, here's our operating versus versus capital, or one's bigger or smaller. And yeah, 100%. And in the, the day, it's all fit to us. So yeah. yeah. OK. I don't have anything else. I'm good. Crystal. I'm good, thank you. Anything else? So Zach, do you just want to talk about number of calls that you've made this year versus the numbers? 
Uh, sure. Um, uh, we're, our call volume is always going up. Um, our, uh, we measure by calendar year just because it's easier and that's typically the reporting periods. Um, so for 2022, our total uh, patient assessments, and I choose that language uh, specifically, was 1,216. Um, and that was uh, a little less than 10% over the previous year. The previous year was like, 12% over the, the year before that. Um, and so that's that's pretty consistently going up. Um, our mutual aids have been holding relatively steady. There was some consternation there for a while as our neighbors to the north were kind of sorting out their own ambulance responses and things like that. We were going there pretty often. Um, but I would, the consistently we are over 100 calls a month. Um, and so over three calls a day, usually it's, you know, one or two between the hours of nine to five and then that third in the overnight. And the law of averages are going to be sometimes you do five or six calls back to back and then nothing for two days and things like that. As I'm getting some like knowing <laughs> <laughs> nods over there. Um, but it's it's only going up and it will only continue to go up. So so just have, and, and, and it's been said to us on the Board of Oversight, I saw the South County EMS ambulance on on route two in charlemont and it and it doesn't happen often but zach you want to explain that yeah so um so we participate in mutual aid and that is if everybody was equipped and staffed to cover everything they might ever need we would objectively be over equipped and overstaffed it's just like when you have a house fire we call in all the neighboring fire departments to all bandy together for the really important and big stuff and normally day to day we can take care of our own and so ambulances are no different and when we have a multi-car accident in the center of south deerfield you know we could have two full crews on of paramedics but if we need a third ambulance we or reach four. out to a neighbor. Or, or fifth, fifth, or sixth, or, or fifth, seventh. Or sixth. Um, and we reach out, and, and the understanding is that we're having a tough day, they're gonna come help us. When they're having a tough day, we'll go help them. And as we call it mutual aid, because as long as it's mutual, um, then it all comes out in the wash. And we still bill for those, you know, if we are responding to Hatfield, because Hatfield's already on a call, we still get the revenue from the patient transport and things like that. Um, when have we ever been called to Charlemont? Yeah, that's a really bad day for the county. And we don't go unless we are the next closest ambulance. And we are happy to respond to those calls because for that person who's having a medical emergency, they need an ambulance and we are happy to provide that service. Um, and our dispatchers at uh, Shelburne Control, they cover all of Franklin County. They work very hard to make sure and coordinate about who's closer to what. And there are times if, you know, Orange has been at cool, uh, Franklin Medical Center dropping a patient off and Greenfield needs another ambulance, and Orange will either get on the radio or the dispatcher has that oversight and they say, you know what, Orange is right there. Hey, do you mind, you're the closest ambulance. And they go, yeah, absolutely. Oh my God, where, what's the address? We'll go right over there. And so that's why you might see a South County truck in a far off distant land and you might see a Northampton or an Amherst or an AMR in South County territory because we were busy caring for somebody else already um, or multiple people at the same incident. So and, and again I just wanted to bring that up because it, it some people 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 see that and it's and but we all work we all work together just like South County goes to Amherst and Amherst comes to South County. South County goes to Conway South County goes to Greenfield, Montague, um, and but conversely, we we very Northampton, Amherst, et cetera, will will come here also. Question on that for you. Um, you had mentioned earlier that when we go out to another town, we bill your you bill that town, and that's a great way of getting you know the guaranteed return. Yeah. Um, How does the reverse work when let's say you need an extra ambulance in Waitley? Yeah. and you call and Amherst sends an ambulance over, is that bill going to the South County or is that bill going to the three towns? So there's two different types of 
calls in which we may be out of our jurisdiction. One of them is mutual aid. That is, there is no ambulance responding. We are the closest ambulance. And we don't bill the town for that. We would bill the patient's insurance for that. Okay. So that so the town doesn't see a cost associated. So if, if Amherst comes in to cover call in Sunderland while we're busy in Waitley or whatever, um, we don't see a bill from Amherst. They just bill the patient uh, okay. directly. The other type of call would be the intercept, which is what Tom spoke of earlier. And that is when paramedics literally intercept a BLS level trained, basic life support level trained ambulance. So like Conway is, they don't have their own paramedics. They don't have the cardiac monitors. They don't have that level of training. But if they have somebody who needs that level of care, um, diff breathing, chest pain, asthma attacks, things like that, anaphylaxis shock, we can get called to intercept them. They pick up the patient and they start driving to the hospital immediately. And while they're en route, we meet them, our paramedics jump on, onto their ambulance and provide a higher level of care. That is where we would bill Conway Ambulance, the town of Conway, okay. for that service. So Conway bills the patient because they were responsible for the transport. We bill Conway for our intercept. We don't. Because we are a paramedic level service, that makes sense. Yeah, we don't need we don't need intercepts. Have we ever, um, with our third ambulance right now, because we don't have a third cardiac monitor, even when there's a paramedic on it, we can only serve at the BLS level. Has our third ambulance ever gone out and been intercepted? Yes, and we get a bill for two hundred and fifty dollars, and that's why there's a line item in here for intercepts for a total of a thousand dollars. Okay. Um. So, um, it's. It's possible, but unlikely. Okay, uh, but but the, the short answer is that if it did, it would go to your budget, yes. and it would go on your line over there. Okay. Yep, yeah. and I'm anticipating a maximum of four, and I don't even think we were intercepted once last year. Yeah. Okay. Great. So, so one one of the things Zoe's not Zoe doesn't say a lot of. Um, I do say a lot. <laughs> well, you, well, you say a lot, but but Zoe, Zoe, Zoe has a hard time um, tooting tooting their own horn. But when when South County first started up, it was talking about life saving, the, the ability to save lives. They don't talk about that anymore. They they talk about the importance of saving quality of life for our residents, and and I I think Zoe, that's probably the biggest thing that you brought is now they actually talk about saving the quality of life and that's a when, when we have South County EMS Board of Oversight meeting it's a whole different conversation that we started 10 12 years ago um, and and I wanted to thank you for that I appreciate that Tom. That's a, a totally different conversation. It's a totally different conversation. And Crystal knows. Crystal, Crystal, Crystal used to ride buses all the time as non-patient. <laughs> <laughs> I've had a lot more patient yeah. interaction yeah. lately. And, but, but, yeah. but, that, but she can attest. Years, but you can attest the, 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 the yeah. and of the frustration of not only of, of being someone riding a bus that cannot offer the services that are offered today. So I, I think the three towns, I think absolutely Tom, I think the three towns should be really proud of being able to get together and create a South County EMS. Um, certainly, I mean, not just from the cost standpoint, um, but we are considered a leader in emergency medicine in the region. Um, I, this is not to um, bemoan any other model, but you'll see a lot of places where either you're private or fire-based or whatever, but as an EMS standalone agency, we're 100% dedicated on the patient care, we're 100% dedicated on the training for providing emergency medicine, we're not answering to two masters, we don't, you know, we don't call ourselves a fire department and then, you know, actually do EMS or things like that, that we really get to drill down and do what's important, and I think that, like, the three towns should be I'm very proud of creating that, and, and I get asked not infrequently to speak to other communities throughout the state about how do we do it, what you're doing. I, I'm going to be going out to the Berkshires pretty soon, actually, to have a similar conversation about how how can they model what the South County is, is doing. So, 
thank you all for making that happen. I live in the service area, so certainly I Thanks. Well, and I have to say, the service is, is amazing. Um, my family, over the last bunch of years, have had called you guys a bunch. <laughs> uh, it's always been amazing. Um, and there is zero way that Sunderland could provide the level of service that you provide for this money on our own. So we appreciate that we have the program. It works out great for everybody. Um, and it's just a brilliant, brilliant idea. Okay, any more questions? Good, Nathaniel? Yep. Crystal, set, set. Jeffrey? Okay. Get out of here, Zoe. Thanks. Okay. I'm sorry to have capitalized. It's so. okay. <laughs> <laughs> Shell shot. <shocked. laughs> You still have to listen to me too. Okay. Jennifer. Hello. Your turn. Um, so, so, I would like to start out by um, sharing some data and some information that um, is affecting um, the increase for the operations budget. Um, as Zoe mentioned, and there are going to be a couple points that I reiterate on because um, while such as EMS is supported by the three towns, so is the South County Senior Center. Although we have an IMA, but, so we're not separate standing um, entity, but maybe that'll be a future thing, Zoe. Um, so as Zoe mentioned, uh, the personnel expenses went up. Uh, Deerfield did a combined total between the step increase and the COLA about five and a half percent. Um, and that information with salaries are increased here um, in the line item. My hourly rate is going to be um, 31.39, program assistant 21.67, and the outreach coordinator uh, went up a few more dollars than anticipated um, under the board of oversight meeting that we had um, by around $3,000 more. Um, about $3,053 more due to the outreach coordinator taking on supervisory over the program coordinator and acting as the um, director when I am out of the office uh, at conference or whatnot. Um, at this point in time, when I am out, um, I'm referring people to Jeff and Casey uh, Warren, who's the town administrator for Deerfield. So, um, some noted changes for last year. Oh, and also going back to the outreach coordinator, um, the Board of Oversight voted uh, with the Senior Center voted to support increasing the outreach coordinator's hours to 35 hours a week instead of where I had adjusted it to 19 and a half hours. Reason being, um, and I'll get to some data to support that in a moment, is we have increased um, our participation from on average of 31 um, people attending the program per day uh, to 60, 61 people per program per day. So we doubled, um, went up about 97% um, in participation at the senior center. We've also provided support and services for um, folks at the senior center. 66 seniors have received services for a specific issue through myself or the outreach coordinator, mainly through the outreach coordinator. Um, for the calendar year of 22. Um, in January 23, so far, we were just hitting the 30th, but as of uh, pulling this report last week on the 23rd, 21 seniors have uh, received individual services. Um, unfortunately, data was not being captured prior to uh, me coming on board in 2022 for services. Um, we have my senior center, which is an annual fee of $1,300 a year. Um, and it's a great program to utilize. So one thing I do want to highlight on as well, we've increased membership by 93 members in calendar year 2022 alone. Um, in 2023, we increased membership by 16 this month. Uh, 41 of those new members are from Deerfield. 27 of those new members are from Sunderland. 15 new members are from Wheatley, and 27 are from non-South County towns. So we have increased our total to act of active members to 319 during calendar 22 to uh, January 25th of 23. Now if you look, um, I don't know all of you have my memo that I, I had sent to Jeff to support, um, but during 2019, which is the last traditional year of activities, 
there was um, 176 members and 326 guests. So those guests maybe have attended one event um, annually or whatnot, and um, we've been able to convert them to regular members. During uh, January to August of last year, we averaged that 31 per day per month per program to 60 uh, starting in September. And we average about uh, 68 for the highest in November in January of last year was 26. Um, so for active members, I just wanted to point out, um, because I know this has been a concern, 28 of those members reside in Waitley, 47 of those members reside outside of the South County area, and the remainder are split between Deerfield and Sutherland. Um, that's a quite a bit of people. And um, since we obtained the administrative space in Sunderland in September we moved in, um, we've seen a, a much larger increase. So I think the fact that the Senior Center is now in all three communities on a regular basis um, is showing a lot of support, or showing interest from each of the three communities to support the Center. Um, a couple points that also have increased the operations budget. The South County Senior Center, as you're all aware, moved into the Holy Family Parish in November of 21. Um, prior to that space, they had been using an outdoor tent, or there is no uh, indoor facility at that time. For calendar year 22, the annual rent was $12,000, $1,000 a month. Um, due to an increase in the parish's utilities, they've increased our rent by $200 a month, um, a total of $2,400 annually, so that's beyond our control. The cost of the Sutherland space is $1,800 a month, $21,600 annually. Um, while I was asked quite a few times, you know, what is the need, how are we affording this, um, we were able to utilize funds that were carry, carry over because um, our revenue, we also have a special revenue fund. So any monies that's um, left over from previous years, we're able to carry it over. It doesn't rule over to the general, general fund for, um, for the towns. Um, so we were able to utilize leftover money because of COVID, there weren't a lot of activities. There wasn't additional uh, money being spent on an indoor space as, as much before or on programming um, for that matter. So, I'm sorry, just want to mention a couple of things. The Board of Oversight's been, up to, or been keeping track and we've been working together to discuss the options moving forward. As you know, at every meeting, it's been a point of um, discussion. What is the plan? What are we doing? As you may or may not be aware, Deerfield Congregational Church, or the former Congregational Church, is being looked at as a potential interim um, temporary location for us to utilize. There is a step, there was a $75,000 grant obtained um, with the support of both Sunderland and Wheatley's select boards, uh, or the Board of Oversight reps, to support the obtaining of the grant so Deerfield got notification, they received $75,000 um, for a feasibility to study to see whether or not that location is even um, a good option for us to utilize in a temporary space. Um, but I will say, since we've been at a um, inviting suitable location, the seniors, you know, the membership's increased. So it's obvious that having a good space is really important. Um, our most attended classes on a daily are exercise classes. Um, and I applied for and received um, some grants to offset, um, to take money that's not on here. So if you're looking at the budget and you're wondering, where's the program cost? How are you paying for events going on, whether it's the exercise classes or other things that we're doing? Um, this year I applied for and received $16,820 worth of grants. So um, $6,000 goes towards Enhanced Fitness, which is part, um, an active program. We have about 24 people who attend that on a daily basis, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. They're usually the same repeat individuals, 
but it goes to show that there is a huge need in being active. Chair Yoga is $3,000. Those are Title III grants, so those um, open us up to a little bit more in-depth reporting. Um, we received some Church Street Home Fund grants, too, for $2,720. Uh, for birding, we were able to purchase five binoculars. We have an interest um, in a variety of programs. A lot of men have come into the center, you know, looking for activities that they would enjoy, and most senior centers gear more towards women. While uh, statistical data will show you that more women um, live longer, there still is a need for supporting men and their interests. So birding is a really interesting way, and um, we've had a variety of people attending. So we now have um, 10 binoculars. I was able to purchase five from monies uh, earlier, and then with this grant, I was able to purchase an additional five. Uh, we're going to be have hosting a writing workshop for people to write down their memoirs, so uh, telling their story. Um, that will cover for the supplies and for the instructor. That will probably start up in March or April. Creative cooking. Um, this goes back to showcasing the Senior Center um, participates in several activities on a regular basis to address food insecurity. And one of those is on the second Wednesday of every month, and this is open, you know, mostly, or to the entire community, not just seniors, but um, for a partnership we have with the Franklin Area Survival Center. So during calendar year 22, we had more than 185 individuals, so around 50 to 75 households, uh, receive support in obtaining groceries, you know, through us for at no cost. So the creative cooking class is to try to um, facilitate seniors who may not be interested in some of the items. They may not take them that are offered, um, you know, different options and different ways of cooking. So I'm working with FCAT to facilitate a cooking class that seniors we can reach that are homebound, that get the brown bag, or delivered. Um, we do home deliveries to people who can't make it to pick this up if they're homebound. Um, so we're able to do that. We also participate with the brown bag, um, Food Bank Western Mass brown bag program. I recently took that over as our um, volunteer of 30 plus years, Nancy Futura, just decided to step down from that after 30 years. So I'm um, grateful to her, but that's taking on a little bit more, which is one of the reasons um, I also wanted to have the outreach coordinator come on board full-time hours because we're trying to accomplish more, which is uh, leading to a, a higher workload and some weeks were 50 hour weeks for myself and I uh, was a little bit much. Um, one of the other pieces under the food insecurity that we've been working on is becoming a partner with the Department of Transitional Assistance and UMass through their SNAP partnership. Um, this benefits us in a couple different ways. Not only does it make us a central location for the community to, to apply for SNAP um, and do recertifications, we also get reimbursed for, them, um, for what we had already been doing pretty much. We were helping folks with finding and navigating the process for SNAP online, um, but in this first quarter, because we didn't do as many hours as we would like to, um, we will be getting back $568.84 for the time that we did spend. Um, and that was for seven and a half hours for the outreach coordinator, five and a half hours by myself, and two hours for the uh, program coordinator. Um, you know, between training, uh, doing outreach, talking about the program, and um, so we get reimbursed for our lease expense, our staff expense, and you know other administrative um, items that we negotiated at the beginning of the process with uh, Department of Transitional Assistance. This year, we are able to be reimbursed up to $9,000, and that will depend um, on whether or not we, you know, how many people we help um, is based on that. There's only so much money that can be reimbursed for outreach versus um, the amount of uh, time spent helping an applicant, you know, with the actual process. 
um, to showcase some other things we've done. We had a Friendsgiving meal in November um, where we had 106 um, individuals attend for the congregate meal. Uh, Life Path takes that day as an administrative day every year. It's the Monday after Thanksgiving, so there is a need for food support. Um, with the success of that, um, Tom and I had a conversation to see if there was a need in the community for hosting um, a meal, delivering it to people um, in the community on Christmas Day. So we delivered more than 53 meals uh, who may not otherwise have had a meal for Christmas Day, and uh, six meals or so were given to, I believe, EMS or the fire station that we had left over. Um, we had probably close to 100 individuals reach out for volunteer opportunities, um, you know, whether to prepare, package, and deliver those meals. So it's a really great way to bring the community together. Um, the other reason for the increase in hours for the outreach coordinator is transportation. So during uh, calendar year 22, um, I got this data from Fran Fortino, who is with Valley Viewers. Around 160 individuals um, were looking for transportation support through Valley Viewers. A lot of them came as referrals through us. Um, the problem is, and I'm sure all of you are aware, we, we service the area that's right on the cusp or border between the FRTA and the PVTA, and even though Sunderland is technically um, Franklin County, you know, the PBTA has the services through here, so it creates a little bit of an issue for folks trying to get to doctor's appointments that have to go over to Hampshire County, um, shopping trips, things along those ways. So I offered um, trips in November to the shopping mall area on Route 9. Um, we had one person the first time, four people the second time, and then we did, um, you know, we've been trying to help other people in the community as well. We've had um, some homeless individuals that we've been working with. One is now um, set up with a shelter and such at Amherst. Um, we're still providing some you know, interim support just so they don't feel like they're just shifted off because they do, um, they're, they're right over the border in Amherst, you know, so it's not far. Um, but getting down to the nitty gritty of some of the budget stuff. So the carryover items that I really want to focus on um, that is, and, and a couple other things. I'm going to start with the operations budget first, but you also have the formula grant, which is something um, every community gets from the state, $12 per senior. So in 2023, um, for fiscal year, that number changed, increased, and I'll go back to that in a minute, but I just, so when you're looking at numbers, um, there are different numbers than what you may have seen in the past and what looked like for uh, the trend for things like that last year. So in fiscal year 23, I asked each of the finance committees to increase and, and change over the, uh, the payroll or salary from the outreach coordinator um, to the operations budget. And that hadn't shown up here before since 2019. The reason being is that last year we were told that the SIG, which is the service incentive grant, um, would be going out to all 350 towns, or 351 towns, for uh, payment or opportunity to apply for as a grant. At that point in time, 18 towns, which include um, Deerfield, Sunderland, and Waitley, were receiving um, the service incentive grant. And because the state had so much extra money from the ARPA funds left over, they decided to continue it the way they had. So we received $13,135.05. That's not on your budget spreadsheet because it's a separate formula grant which totally paid for the outreach coordinator. Um, and it's a grant, so it's not a guarantee moving forward. So you'll see, I went back and read and put SIG and formula, um, so you'll understand what that is. The previous amount of money that had been in there was fifteen or was um, um, $15,000 last year that I had asked for. Um, so the, um, 
If you move down here, you'll see that the $1,300 for 23 um, went up from $1,200. Reason being is I went by actual figures and data, so the bill from last year, so we went up to $1,300 for the My Senior Center. center. So that was an increase of $100. Um, I also jumped up with the so security software support laptops. I don't know if this information had been uh, collected previously under the miscellaneous expenses, but I figured it needed to be categorized in the appropriate areas so people could see where this was really being spent. $500 annually is spent on a sonic wall, which is basically um, security for the internet or you know for the programs or whatnot. It's an actual unit, um, so that went up, and then that's reflected in there. And then the additional support we're paying for um, costs if when we call into Northeast IT and things along those lines for for support. Um, You'll notice there was a decrease in water and sewer. Centerlin is not charging us that money unless our usage goes up exponentially. Um, so that's saving us quite a bit of money there annually. Um, um, you know, if we start having a program full time in the Sutherland space and we're using a lot more water, I'm sure it would go up, but at this point we're not. Um, so I changed the repair slash parts to $100 because we don't have to pay for repairs and things, but if we have to buy a garden hose or we have to buy something along those lines, um, I put that cost down here. So you'll notice um, the $16,200 in red for fiscal 23, and it bumps up to $22,140 for 24. That is the Sunderland space. I used the um, monies that would have been spent paying the operate or the outreach coordinator to pay for that as well as um, adjusting some of the other expenses that, are, that were noted in red just so you can see the comparisons. The bottom line number never changed for 23. Um, so the major expenses for going up for 24 is the admin space which wasn't originally calculated in 23 and the, the full-time salary. Now you're, you're probably asking why there's only $22,238 for someone going full time, and the Medicare expense is actually reflected at the fuller rate um, on this area here. Well, if you, we'll move over to the formula grant that I was just speaking of in a second, but I want you to look at 24 on the ops budget where there's a carry forward of $20,591. Um, that is the carry forward funds that has been accumulating um, because it's a special revenue fund. So that total amount will be utilized in order to offset this particular um, budget. Now, I heard you specifically ask Zoe previously, so how do you fund this when you're moving forward? Well, there's a couple other things um, that I'll talk about after, but with the opportunity of getting $9,000 for just this uh, fiscal year partnering with for the SNAP program, we may be able to get that. We may only get a fraction, and maybe we only get um, you know forty five hundred dollars, but it's still monies that we weren't expecting to have coming in the door. Um, but I have really worked hard over the past year to reduce um, to reduce our our spending. Uh, to you know, take inventory of what we actually have for supplies. Um, if someone were to ask me to order certain things, I'd look at them and go, "There's the cabinet. We have you know a million things. No one needs to order anything." Um, but we have so many more people coming in the door, and that is really huge. I don't know if you are all aware of this or not, but our population um, is around 32 percent of seniors. It's only going to increase you know, at, uh, moving forward. And we have to really be prepared. While I know the majority of that looking forward is coming up with a five-year plan that I'm working on, including, you know, finding a, a usable space, um, it's really important to invest in this because the need in our community um, has really shown between the needs assessment that was conducted in UMass and then the, um, 
per cognate that was done. We had 1,300, I believe, 96 people respond to the UMass survey, and there is a, a large need for transportation, there's a large need for housing, there's a large need for food insecurity, um, and I know, Deer, I know Sunderland just had the Sanderson house, they just moved into, or Sanderson place they just moved into, we were uh, really happy to be a part of the lottery process, getting that information out to people. Um, and Deerfield, I know, is in the process of working on um, senior housing and their community. But the need for housing in our area is really high. Um, we've seen, amongst my peers that are on the Franklin Regional um, Housing Network, are seeing uh, an increased need for, um, for housing. There isn't enough beds in shelters, so when legislators tell us go put the, you know sign up for a shelter, they can't. They're not turning them away. <coughs> That's not true. So there's more of a need for us for finding resources um, for members in our community. Um, so going over to the formula fund, which is noted as two nine one, um, you'll see. There's an increase in this fiscal year for 23 of $13,216. That was about the ballpark amount as to uh, salary for our average coordinator at his current step. Uh, or actually, it'll be going up to $22.48 an hour with the supervisory before the fiscal year 23, or 24 hits. So when 24 hits, it'll be the 23.16, which is listed um, on here. The reason being is that the federal government, or at least the state of Massachusetts, has decided to utilize the projected census data for 2020 um, from UMass, I believe, Phillips. Um, I apologize, I don't have the uh, exact name in front of me. For the agency, they did a, ca a calculation estimate. So each senior for each community gets $12 based on that census data from 2020. For the past, since 2010, last federal census, we've been utilizing that data. Um, and unfortunately, there will not be a reimbursement for the past three years where we have been underfunded. Um, I can share with you that the Mass Council on Aging um, that we're members of has applied, or has uh, submitted a letter to legislature lobbying to increase that from $12 per senior to $14 per senior. So hopefully uh, we will be able to uh, see that increase come in, um, as well as actual data, not just the guesstimate from UMass. Um, UMass is ballparking the federal census data, um, but the federal census hasn't released their actual official data. Um, so, you know, that could leave it in in the future. But for the current year of 23, where we got the increase of 12,000, um, sorry, you guys are back to this. $12,504. They will not take any money away from that if we were to be off. Um, so looking at the formula fund, the carry forward for that is $8,665.45. Um, in the past, they did not let us towns carry forward funds for this, but with COVID and everything, they changed their stance on that for the state. Um, so this is a grant this is not anything that any of the towns pay into. The only thing that happens is when you receive the grant, because Deerfield's the fiduciary, they send a bill to uh, each of the towns for, for the amount that was granted from the town to go into the pot so I can spend it um, in the way that it's intended. But I, I share this with you, this information for the formula grant, because I want you to see how I'm offsetting expenses that are not in the operations budget. And it's also really important to know um, that that money is money that the towns don't pay the state funds. So that's $39,756 up from the $27,252 we used to receive. So that will pay for almost half of the outreach coordinator's salary. It fully funds the program coordinator's salary. So if this grant were to go away, we would totally lose our program coordinator unless it moved over to the operations budget. Um, it also pays for um, that person's Medicare cost, 
and uh, their longevity pay. In Deerfield, when an employee has been there for 10 years or more, they receive a certain um, amount of money, like a bonus kind of a thing, I would assume. Um, we have also, you'll also see an increase in a couple things. Postage. I don't know if all y'all have gotten your uh, forever stamps, but I suggest getting another rule before the next increase because our six page newsletter has gone up from around 50 something to 70 something to 81 cents per mailing now. Um, we're trying to get individuals to get it electronically. However, with our age demographic, um, a lot of people like to have a tangible copy. So our uh, printing and our postage costs have practically doubled because of how many people we have receiving the newsletter. So we, um, you know, and I also don't think it was, I don't think this data was being tracked correctly previously to me coming on board. <clears throat> There's a lot of things I have found that weren't reflected in this budget. Um, you know, it is the year, the past year, tomorrow was my one year anniversary, just in case you didn't know. Um, there's a lot of things that were just miscellaneously marked, or um, I don't think it was being, it might have been coming out of the grant or gift account, which I, I'm sure you are all aware we do have a gift account. Um, that balance right now is around between nine and ten thousand dollars. That money goes towards um, entertainers that come, you know, that don't get funded by the uh, MCC grants, the Cultural Council grants. We have them apply for those. But there are some activities that happen. Um, you know, I also changed around what we receive or have for snacks. We've increased uh, putting out fresh fruit on a daily basis. We put cheese and crackers out, you know. We um, try to change it up to be a more healthier option for snacks because um, through some of the wonderful community partnerships we have, we do receive um, you know, donations of bread and donations of some uh, sugary things, but you want to have a balance. So while you do have those items, you still want to change it up. We do receive regular donations for, um, for folks who, you know, who can't afford to. Um, but as we all know, the uh, economic and climate for everyone, including I know with the towns, is a bit, bit off. Um, let's see. So you'll also know I cut our miscellaneous program costs from the formula fund. From uh, it was averaging thirty three hundred dollars a year. I cut it to zero because I want to make sure that everything's categorized, has the right place, but also um, to maybe utilize that. Um, donation fund if I need to. Um, but so with that being said, we would carry uh, some of that 8665, we would carry 1458 for fiscal year 23 and then 7208 for fiscal 24. Now, if we're able to get more money back from spending time for the SNAP partnership, um, and then I'm also gonna talk quickly about the mass in motion. Um, oh, does anybody have any questions for Jennifer? Nathaniel, all set? Oh, I'm, I'm good for now, yeah. Okay. One question. <laughs> but the mass in motion yeah. does have a, a, a monetary component to it, so can I touch on that piece before we talk about the whole process? Um, so this particular grant opportunity, um, I'll go into the, the weeds of it after, but it has the combined um, it has the option to provide up to $12,690 back to, this, or towards the senior center uh, by the end of this fiscal year of 23. The funds can be utilized for salary, um, which would be mostly for the outreach coordinator, myself for doing reports and other things if needed, but also for food, um, you know, snacks for the work groups, child care for any volunteers for the work groups, a travel and, um, you know, also like lease space and things like that for the meetings. But um, so we have the potential to help offset some of those salary expenses for up to three years. I don't know if you're aware of that. So I just wanted to share that part. So um, that's a second question I have, so I'm glad to share that. Uh, one question is just, um, I'm seeing retirement jump considerably, almost double. Yep. Is that cap? Is that capturing the um, additional benefit? No. 
So what that is capturing is um, how it was explained to me from Deerfield's accountant um, okay. is for 23, this money was to pay for the previous director's benefit um, in terms of that person's retirement. Okay. So for 24, that is what um, would be paid for my retirement. So for 25, yeah. it probably will be higher. I don't know okay. um, the exact amount percentage-wise because... Um, this was given to you though. This information, yes, this yeah. was given okay. as a percentage, so this is what it was basically based on, the salary for that. Um, I didn't know if it was a proportion of all employees. So right now, as of today, I am the only benefited okay. employee. Right. Um, when the outreach coordinator, uh, there's one more board meeting, it has to go through the personnel board, um, because the board of oversight for the senior center voted to support it. The, um, Deerfield Select Board voted to support it, but the uh, personnel board canceled their meeting last week due to the storm. So uh, we're or not having a forum. So I don't know when the next meeting would be for that. So once that person goes on, we'll, we'll have to reassess for that cost okay. later. So, so could that potentially change? In yes. This budget. Um, but so that could. So for this fiscal year in twenty three, um, the. Ex Expenditure listed for the $5,100 for the group insurance. Uh -huh. I did not take the health insurance because I have other means of that. So that $5,100 more than likely will carry forward. Okay. So that may be um, able to be an offset. Okay. Um, that's not a guarantee that when the outreach coordinator comes full time or something in my circumstances change that that may not uh, be utilized in the future. We don't want to count on that. Yes, that's why I made sure that there's something in here. You, you have to make life decisions that are good for you, not exactly. The budget. Exactly. Um, and I think you just answered my other question. It was it was to the to the carry forward funds. We used the term retained earnings earlier. I, mine is just more a theoretical question. Is sure. what what uh, why that number? What goes into that decision? You're, it, it seems like you're essentially choosing to apply twenty thousand five nineteen ninety one. Um, to the operating budget. Yep, so the... Um, what was your thought process in choosing that amount? Sorry, I'm just gonna go back to it. Um, so basically what I chose to do was to help offset the coordinator's salary because okay. if, um, for example, if we were to come up with, and, and this is something that the Board of Oversight's been discussing, putting out an RFP for space, in the future. So it's if we were to find a space where we wouldn't need to have the Sunderland space and the church or either or, um, you know, that could reduce our costs. Because right now we're at $36,540 for, for a year for both of those spaces. Um, so since we were able to take, we got the state grant and the formula grant to cover the outreach coordinator's um, salary this fiscal year, I chose to use those funds to pay for an adequate office space because we're able to meet, um, just, I'm not sure a lot of people understand this piece. We're only at the parish Monday, Wednesday, and Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. So that gives us only 15 hours a week there. It doesn't really have a lot of private space. So say a senior wants to come in and they want to talk with myself or the outreach coordinator mostly about different circumstances going on in their life and referrals and financial pieces. Um, having the space in Sunderland offers that. Mm -hmm. It also um, isn't set up where, uh, you know, we have drop-in days and we have office hour days. So if someone drives by and sees, you know, John, Jones's car, they're not going to automatically assume there's a negative inference there. And we want people to feel welcome. And we want people not to feel judged because they are seeking house support. And I think the fact that we had 66 individuals looking for support last year who received services shows that, um, you know, we've already had 21 in January. It goes to show that we're creating an environment that people feel comfortable and safe and they um, are okay with coming in. Um, you know, to seek that support. 
So it's, and in the front of the space, if you haven't been before, we have space to host up to 50 people. We have a sitting area um, with a sofa and two, two nice chairs and this coffee table. We have a computer lab. Um, we have a lending library. We have like a little movie area, so if people want to sit, we have three cushy chairs with a nice TV that was donated. Um, we also have an arts and crafts section, and then we have a games area. So today, um, you know, I have a group of seniors. Sometimes it's only four or five people. Sometimes two. It was only two today. They come in to play cards because they don't have a place they can go to gather together. Um, you know, to have that quality time. So. We're trying to make it so we can be open more hours. Um, one of the comments in the needs assessment was having you know later hours or having different activities that would interest people. Um, because when you say senior center, people think, oh, I'm too young to come here. Um, I don't see certain individuals at the center, but I know people work. You know, so it's it's giving people. Um, a different feel for the senior center, what it is, um, and rebranding is kind of the thought that I've had as well for the five year plan. Um, but if you can have more um, buy in from the community and by showing people that we're in all three communities, not just one, um, from per perception, I think it shows that we have a value. Um, the SNAP program is not just for seniors, we can offer that to anybody. Um, you know, we, there's people in the community who, who need it. They may be on that cusp of, they're 50, they're 40, you know. Maybe they're a single mom or dad with two kids and they need the support. You know, we want to be available because then they'll know that their parents or, or friends or whatnot could, you know, be referred over. So one, one of the things I hope is going to happen is that at our last Board of Oversight meeting, we talk about the importance to start stop looking year to year to start looking at five years, and and I think that was huge. Ho hopefully, we're going to have a five year housing um, plan shortly. We're first supposed to be having a group go over to the uh, to the congregational church, a former congregational church in Deerfield, to see if it can if it can be renovated to meet the needs of the center if it, if it if it can then deerfield ready to spend money they have money set aside to to do that if not we are ready to put out an rfp to try to find a location try to find a location for looking at five years so hopefully we would be able to take that that money that we're paying rent at two different locations combine it into one place and move forward next year I, I I think right now we're paying. We're, we're I'm not saying we're overpaying, but we're not we're not probably getting the best bang for our buck. Yeah, I was going to say how many hours a day did you say in Holy Family? Five. Five hours. Okay. But we're only there three days a week. Yeah, it was like that's ninety two dollars a day we're essentially paying. So, uh, five five hours. Yeah, it's actually around two hundred forty seven dollars. Yeah. Um, because it's not every. I right. Just, I just didn't. Yeah. Um, 12, 12, 12 a month times 52. Or, yeah. So yeah, we're not 12. even. So some holidays, we're not there on the holidays. Um, you know, and it, it varies. Um, but it, they do have a couple things that we don't. Summerland doesn't have a ton of parking. We're yeah. able to utilize the bank if we needed to, you know, with permission ahead of time. Um, but. Uh, there's no parking, and you can't, like, when we have large events, sometimes, like, the congregational meal that we have for our friends getting, we add over 100 people. Yeah, you can't host convenient. that, you know, with that space, and um, that's, it's one of the downfalls. Yeah. So, so, so there, we're trying. <laughs> I, I mean, and right now, and, and again, we, we can't keep start, start looking at one year. So what what end up happening, we end up having to do something versus planning to do something we have to do something and we don't we don't sometimes you're, you're not able to make good decisions that way yeah um it, yeah i'm gonna ask the question that you asked the question previously when i when i see raising retained earnings against the operating budget i just want to yeah ask that question but what i also hear from both both presentations tonight is that you also have plans for that so for you it's twenty thousand. you think that 
you may potentially see income from SNAP and I think you said mass emotion. Yep. Potential upside there too to offset yes. that. Which would offset that. Um, the mass in motion part. Um, do you have any questions before I go into that? I just want to make sure. Um, actually, one thing. Um, I'm just looking at the the year to year numbers um, from 2018 to this year. It looks like the per per town or the total has tripled, um, and it sounds like I just want to make sure that, that I'm on the same page as you. It sounds like the majority of that is either grants that were covering things and were being listed in different ways than they are now, um, or um, yeah. So I, I, I'm seeing a grant here. The you know, that it's only in those first two years and then it drops off and there's that huge almost 50 percent increase the following year so, am i correct in thinking that the majority of this of these numbers being different comes down to just how these reports are being calculated and how the, how the money's being moved around and that the senior center is not actually costing the the it's not actually costing three times as much as it did five years ago um so to speak to that First, uh, this has been my full year. Yes, tomorrow is the one year that I've been here, so I've only been through one budget season prior to this. Yep. Um, two, previously for the scene, for the director, they were not full time, so I'm forty or I'm salary. My normal expectation is forty hours, but I typically work more than forty hours a week. Um, so the previous people who were here were only part time, so that's a a, a pretty good increase. The um, also, there was no uh, there was no rental fee, so there wasn't money spent um, for the Holy Family Parish gotcha. nor for the Sunderland space because they were utilizing um, the old building, uh, which is referred to as the eighteen eighty eight building. If you talk to or the old grammar school yep. um, in South Deerfield, I'm sure you've been by it. Before. Oh, I I uh, grew up in Shrewsbury, and for a whole year we, we we trucked down there to that school while it was being renovated back in the late eighties. Uh, so I know that school very, very well. Which on North Main Street? Maybe I'm thinking of the other old. You're thinking about I'm thinking old about Deerfield. The, yeah, I'm thinking about that one. All right. So I was like, I don't think it's been renovated any time before. No, don't so know, you're right. I'm thinking of the wrong one. That's okay. Um, I just wanted to make sure because I was like, oh, that's been renovated. That's kind <laughs> so, of so quick, quick question. Yep. Then if you those grants, I was just gonna yep. answer to those. The SIG grant. So the SIG grant was the grant I referred to, the 13135.05. Yep. So what happened was um, a person came in and they, they stopped reporting stuff on here because it's come, it, they're use, utilizing it for specific things. The service incentive grant is specific for the outreach coordinator salary. Okay. So it's not being split amongst this. If So if you look at 23, how I wrote in red, um, I wrote SIG and formula. Yep. So that actually takes some of the monies um, during 23 and puts it towards um, the SIG grant and the formula grant for, for the outreach coordinator's salary. Okay. The formula grant also funds, um, is that other sheet I gave you for 291. So yep. all of that here is what that reflected uh, 22200 back in 2019. Okay. So this is a whole budget, so you can see where all the money goes to. I yep. think in the past, it looked like they utilized it just to take off from what the towns were paying at that point in time. Plus, you know, between the salary of the director increase during the last few years, going from part-time to full-time, and then for last year, or 23, and then for 24, adding the... Um, the two locations uh, made it go up, okay. you know, a lot more. But it's also safe to say that that because there's more hours for the director and there's and there's more services being offered, that what we're getting for the money this year is a lot more than we were getting for a lot less money back in 2018 because we didn't have the full time staff that we have now. We didn't have yes. the, the extra billion. Okay. Yes. That and, makes a lot of sense. And if you uh, you look at the memo, the data I shared with the amount of participation even in 2019. Um, was you know around half of what we're we're seeing now from members who come on a regular basis. So that really says a lot. Yep. Um, if it, if this was the EMS budget, I'd have a lot bigger problem with the the jumps because you wouldn't expect EMS services to increase year to year by yeah. a, a huge chunk. Um, but if we're talking about going from underserving these communities in 2018 to doing a better job of serving them today, 
and that costs more money, well, that's great. You know, that totally makes sense, and you know, I want to see us adequately supporting those those costs. So, okay, yeah. that's all I wanted to. Yeah, that's definitely it because. Um I had a conversation recently with the program coordinator about you know some data stuff and memberships and things like that, and it was shared that pretty much the same cohort of folks, it was around 24 people, um, were the only people who came to the center for a very long time. Um, so we've you know over the last year been able to increase membership last year 93 and this month alone by 16. Um, that goes to show that we're really branching out. And while. Um, some of them are non-South County residents, you know, we're serving people from Conway, people from Greenfield, people from Leverett, so they're not too far off, um, you know, even people from, a few folks from Amherst, Hadley, um, because they not only come to our center, but there's a group who will go to multiple senior centers, so if we were open more often, they might, you know, come to, to our center more. And I would also imagine there's Sunderland residents who go to Greenfield oh, and yeah. go to Amherst. Yeah. So we all kind they of go to Hadley, yeah. they go to Amherst. You know, I think it, it all depends on what services are offered. And that's, that's a huge piece to it. Um, and we recently uh, added a seated dance class. Um, that one class alone increased membership by 11. And we have people coming uh, who are residents in Deerfield and South Deerfield and Sunderland who haven't been here for years are now coming back. So they were members, they just weren't active here. Wonderful. So, so any, does anyone have any additional questions on the budget? No, I'm good. Good? I'm good. Jeffrey? Nope. Jennifer? Do you want me to go over mass in motion for you? Yes. So, so so we're mass emotion is something that the board needs to discuss. So if you, I mean, you're welcome to stay, but you don't need to stay. I gave you the financial synopsis of that part. I appreciate okay. that. Okay. <laughs> All right. As my daughter is texting, where are you on? <laughs> Thank you. Um, thanks for entertaining my questions. I appreciate it. Thank you for asking the question you need to be asked. We appreciate it also. Yeah. Sure. See you guys again. So some, some just so you know, the, um, Rachel and Carol were here a couple of weeks ago, so uh, the select board has the background on the yeah. whole program, yeah. so just... Great. Um, so, I was just going to say, I know that uh, Rachel and Carol did go to all three towns. I, I think they're going to wait. Did they already hit Waitley or are they going tomorrow? Um, anyways, I know that Deerfield voted um, on Friday. I did a presentation to them to support it. Basically, what I was, was asking all three of the towns to do, um, and this is the concern. So when I met with Rachel and Carol and the other individuals on this committee, um, they're, so you're aware of the program, I'm not going to go into all the details, but we were concerned about, one, um, since each of the town was getting around $4,230, you know, could they actually hire somebody in, for individual town? Um, you know, the bureaucratic process, how long is it gonna take to get someone on board? The data that was captured by FERCOG's needs assessment was far less than what um, the UMass needs assessment captured. So in working in conjunction um, by facilitating work groups under the direction of the, or facilitated by the outreach coordinator and then myself when needed, um, we would be able to work together under the existing IMA instead of having to have each town go out, find someone to either volunteer or get minimal stipend um, because each grant is $4,230 collectively over $12,000. So that money could go towards offsetting some of the expenditures for the salary and the uh, meeting space. So, you know, breaking it down for grants like I usually do now. I come up with, an, like, say they meet for an hour or two hours, I can break it down for this much money goes towards um, the cost of the space, this goes towards the cost of the salary. Um, we're providing, maybe we're providing child care stipends for people who want to participate who normally can't. Um, and then for people who have to travel, you know, there is a certain amount. Um, that is a question I have because Deerfield bases their mileage at 42 cents a mile. I don't know if the other two towns have a different rate. Um, so 
if a volunteer lives in Sunderland, is it less money? You know, you have to kind of be equitable across the board. Um, but in doing so, what we would do is invite people to come talk about the two main concerns that were brought up from the major point of the needs assessment through UMass. Um, Tom, I don't think the Board of Oversight ever voted to share that publicly or, or what at this point. So that was transportation and food insecurity. Housing, we're not going to touch on because in Sunderland, housing already you know, has been addressed here. Deerfield's got an ad hoc senior housing committee working on it. Waitley, however, um, I, I'm unsure. I know that Joyce, um, who is the other Board of Oversight member from Waitley, has mentioned some things. But I can tell you that there are individuals living in motels in Waitley um, who need housing more than just living in a, hotel, a motel um, for their regular housing every every month. Um, but I see that becoming a, a, a big issue down the line because we get seniors who call and say that people who've come in and purchased their property, whether it's a house, a rental unit, um, they want people to end their lease early, people move out so they can renovate it and then charge them double than what they're currently paying. Um, so the housing market rate is, you know, it's, it's a crisis now, it's just going to get worse. Um, so at some point, I think, you know, we're going to have to address that as a county more than just towns because you can only do so much. Um, anyways, getting back to that other piece, um, in working under the existing IMA uh, and being able to facilitate those expenses, we would be able to actually work together with people from um, Deerfield, Sunderland, lately. Uh, you know, we could host something at the parish during the time we have there, you know, maybe at noon time. We could do stuff in the evening hours in Sunderland because we have that space. We could also work, you know, to be a wait leader to facilitate stuff at the, um, the old uh, town hall, hall or, you know, using their other space. But transportation and food insecurity would be the main um, pieces. And we could also work to try to bring in community partners like the PBTA and the FRTA to see if we can have that dialogue, you know, um, because those pieces are really important. Um, one of the things I noted in here, uh, I'm not sure, our transportation piece, um, you know, we, we increased, so, the UMass Center for Social and Demographic Research on Aging Gerontology Institute, we had 1,393 responses. Out of those, 307 respondents said that they depend on family or taxi slash ride share for transportation. 633 respondents shared they do not drive or limit their driving. 516 respondents responded they would have difficulty in getting transportation they need and 92 respondents shared they would use the South County Senior Center if transportation was offered. Now, knowing that Valley Neighbors had um, around 160 requests, and they could not meet all of them due to um, them being strictly a volunteer organization, it shows that you know there is a really big need for more activity through the Senior Center with the utilization of our van, um, the possibility of partnering with Valley Neighbors to create a volunteer um, you know, driving service, drive, set schedule, but um, other councils on aging in the state utilize a, a volunteer driving service. So you just have to look at the liability issues um, that each of the towns may be faced with. Um, or you hire part-time drivers. But it's basically looking at where the biggest needs are, and that's what these work groups would do. Um, because it's really important to have voices from all aspects of the community because you do have caregivers um, who utilize different services you know that may not always be heard or have a say in something um, so you know depending on their schedule you, you have um, you know younger parents who uh, they call sandwich generation you're taking care of your you know elderly parent while you also have raising your children so there's a lot of different things, um, and then you have Jennifer. A lot of I think people. we need. We've yeah. been here for like two hours. We have I'm more to do. <laughs> My phone's gonna die. Um, I, I think the the general idea is: Do we want to do this ourselves, or do we want to do it with 
Deerfield and, and Waitley and combine our resources. Combine the resources. Yeah, I, I'm 100% on that. Combine the resources. Yeah. Great. Do you want to take a... Deerfield took a vote, right? Motion. Yes. A motion we combine resources with the other South County Senior Centers. Downs to for the mass and motion. Seconded. All right, motion made and seconded to work along with Deerfield and Whiteley with the uh, mass and motions. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Jeff three zero. Thank you. Thank you. Alrighty. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we will look at the. Uh, we get all the budget numbers. We'll take a look at everything, right, Jeffrey? Is that overall? Yeah. 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 Is yeah. that another uh, come back to present on your or the finance or I don't know how you No, that was that. finance there. So okay. you're good. Thanks. Have a great night. You too. Our uh, retirement cola. Yeah. So the Franklin County Retirement uh, Board yep. voted to um, increase uh, at, at an additional 2% increase to the retiree COLA starting in fiscal year 26. Um, that would only go into effect if two thirds of the Franklin County towns that participate uh, vote in favor of it. So they uh, asked us to put this on an agenda for Sunderland. Our fiscal year 24 assessment was approximately 392,000. Um, the additional 2% in fiscal year 26 would amount to about $11,000 more. So it's 2% additional on top of the- On top of the, yeah, the, the, the normal the regular program. cola. Yep, and it was just because inflation was high this year. Everything costs more now. Yep. Yep. So, and then the addition that they, you know, there's a emails going back and forth, so just additional information. The two percent on average would increase retiree benefits by two hundred and fifty nine dollars. Um, so total with the cola six hundred and forty seven more than last year. So it's not like <laughs> a windfall. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Do we need to vote on this, or is this? Uh, if you're ready to, uh, if you have questions, or yeah, we vote. can bring that back for next week. Okay. Okay. To vote. Yep. That sounds good. Give some time to think. Yep, we can review it. So I just have one question. Those people, the people that are receiving that retirement, are also Social Security eligible people, correct? If they paid into it. If you paid into it, but if somebody if somebody worked their whole life in the municipal side, they don't get Social Security. Okay. All right. I just want to make sure I have that understanding when yeah. I. So and and then and that. then then if you did work the municipal and you got Social Security. They have what they call the windfall provision also that they lose money. Oh, yes. Yeah. Um, no, I just wanted oh, to yes. make sure that I... Yeah, there's, there are two separate things. Yeah. So if you, if you spent your entire career in municipal, like, like if you're a police officer and you didn't, and you didn't work, and right. you wouldn't get a Social Security. Yeah, you're just getting yeah. just retirement only. Yeah. Right. Uh, Franklin County Solid Waste Municipal Employee Vote. Yes, so we're still waiting for a recommendation from the Energy Committee on who to actually appoint. But in the meantime, um, the board requested that um, we vote to make special municipal employees, uh, excuse me, board members special municipal employees so that they can have multiple positions. Um, really? Yeah. I think there was a select board member and it's a county position and a town position you can't hold two yeah yeah no it's so why wouldn't well be far for me to understand the ways of ways lawyers but i thought the only thing you had to do was you had to just each a select board member is a special a select board member is already a special municipal employee i thought Yes, but uh, but the Franklin County Solid Waste Management District is, position is not. So I think they both need to be. So why would? I I guess my only question is that then why wouldn't that town? Why wouldn't that person? 
is it done on a regional basis that you I I, I thought I see I guess I don't understand why we're being able to why we're being asked that does that make sense um, I'm not sure well right now we're covered we can be municipal employees in our town in our, our town it also has to deal about the size of your community mm -hmm. right so if there were 5,000, 10,000, whatever, that, that being said, that being said, why would we care if a, a representative from Orange is a select board uh, member and a Franklin County whatever? Because, so I think the answer is because if one member is going to be a special municipal of a board is going to be a special municipal employee, then all of them do. So even though we don't have somebody on the board, we are voting to say when we do put somebody on the board, they will be a special municipal. I mean, I think that. Was I mean, the is there any drawback question. to that? I don't see any reason why we don't say, "Yeah, sure, that's great." And I don't see any real drawback to making that be the case, unless I'm missing something. There's no, it's just, it's just more, it's just more confusing for the person that's that's doing the job. Fair enough. <laughs> I, I I think I, I think it's a very simple. There's there's a story behind the story. I'm sure someplace. Okay, so what do you want us to do? What, what two I motions? Know, I know. Yeah. Huh? Two motions. I got my glasses right here. So. Match your shirt, huh? Mm-hmm. Wow. One motion is the select board designates the position of Franklin County Solid Waste District representative as a special municipal employee for the town pursuant to blah blah. And the other is... Same thing just for the alternate. It, the alternate okay. board member. So the alternate representative. So we have to do both these motions? You could probably combine it. All right. Just make a motion for both of them. A motion that the select board designate the position of the Franklin County Solid Waste Management District representative and alternative as special municipal employee position for the town pursuant to Mass General Law Chapter 286A, Section 1. Seconded. Okay, we have a motion made and seconded for two articles or two motion or two items combined into one. To basically, to make the uh, Franklin County Solid Waste Management District Rep and alternate special municipal employees pursuant to the town. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 I'm going to vote no because I think it's a waste of time. Two of that. I think that might be the first split vote we've had since I've been on the board. It, it had to be because that's it's. <laughs> no, we had a, we had one other one. Jeez, we get so complicated. So that, that's Wait, like that's like before when you obvious. when you had a police cruiser that was in a car accident. The insurance company is paying for the cr police cruiser. But you have to go to a town meeting, used to, you had to go to a town meeting, appropriate the money from the town meeting that you were going to get. And you had to appropriate that money so that you could buy a priest cruiser that the insurance company was going to buy for you anyways. It was totally, not, thankfully, we no longer have to do that, but it was stupid. It was stupid then, it was stupid now. Yep. Yep. That's, that's lawyer talk. <laughs> we keep ourselves in business. Just satisfied. All right, Believe signed me. caucus warrant. Sorry, I just felt that. Sorry, Jen, I I shouldn't have gone, but that was crazy. Uh, yes. So I will read the caucus. Um, a citizen caucus will be held March 6, 2023 at 6 p.m. at the Sunderland Town Offices. Wendy Houle, town clerk or alternate, will call the caucus to order until a chair is chosen. The purpose of the caucus is to nominate for the following town elective officers. 
one assessor for three years, one select board for three years, one board of health for three years, three library trustees for three years, one moderator for one year, one planning board member for five years, Riverside Cemetery trustee, one of them for three years, two Sunderland Elementary School Committee members for three years, and a Frontier Regional School Committee member for three years. Okay, motion. I motion that. We're gonna hold the caucus. There you go. I'm gonna hold the caucus. Seconded. I couldn't remember all now, this. I won't, I won't vote against this one because the town clerk would have a very hard time with, with that, so I don't want to get the town clerk mad at us. So, All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All right. Were we going to put off the, the DLTA thing until next time? Uh, I, well, we risk not getting it if we do. Uh, the application yeah, was due last yeah. week. So district local tech assistance, what do you, where, where are we standing with that, Jeffrey? So um, I went through the application. Um, the things that I checked off that I thought we were interested in, rural policy plan implementation, um, municipal services sharing, specifically facilities management, grant management, HR, IT, planning, and finance. Um, older adult services, senior center expansion, uh, EV charging station implementation. We had talked about EV charging stations. Um, and then a request from the planning board to uh, provide technical assistance to amend our zoning bylaws to address standalone battery storage facilities. So I thought that the, I recommend the top three priorities be, so we can check off as many as we want and then we list the top three. Yeah. Um, the zoning that the planning board requested, because we have gotten inquiries about battery storage, shared senior services, um, whatever support we can get for the senior center, and municipal sharing opportunities. Um, you know, if there is an HR or you know IT or something like that, that police and fire. I'd like to include police and fire also. Police and fire. Yep. So I need to start the discussion. Nope. Right, but then we have to drop one of the other ones, right? It has to be three? Uh, no, municipal sharing opportunities are already in there under oh, Senior oh, oh. Center. So got it. I'll yeah. just got it. Uh -huh. Oh, no, it wasn't. Sorry. It was, that was my third one. Yeah. So it's it. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. Good. Motion? I motion that we accept. The list that Jeff just provided yeah, we us. Forward, we forward the uh, the total, yes. the district local technical assistance Second recommendations. In. Our priorities. Okay. Motion made and seconded. All those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Three zero. Thank you. You. Uh, anybody got any updates? Personnel committee meeting tonight. Still working on. Okay. Nathaniel? Um, have another capital planning committee meeting tomorrow. So I'll have something to report from that next week. Um, right. Otherwise, I think I'm good. Uh, went to the, uh, we went to the uh, MMA conference in Boston. Oh yeah, I went to that too. <laughs> <laughs> Small world. <laughs> um, <laughs> And part of it, the re probably re reason going is because uh, when you go, you can get Maya Maya points. Uh, so we reduce our we reduce our bill. Um, so and and actually, I went to a couple really good Maya ones. One, one in particular about OSHA, and and about maintaining an, an OSHA OSHA three hundred log, that mm -hmm. supposedly Maya is keeping for us. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I thought that was an interesting, con uh, an interesting uh, conference, and and I, I I know you went to the updates in law, right? Labor and hot topics. Probably slept through that, right? It uh, it was riveting. Riveting. <laughs> That's what I would use for. And your sheet the whole time. But but on some of the other ones, it was interesting because I, I went to a very interesting one. I thought it was going to be on on regionalization. And 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 um, there was a group of us from Western Mass that was there, 
and we were surprised that they didn't include people from Western Mass on the regionalization discussion board. And, and they kept talking about the only reason you want to regionalize is save money. And we all said, well, if that's what you're, if you're only getting into regionalization to save money, you're probably doing it for the wrong reason. Yeah. And, and that was contrary to what, was, what they were talking about. Um, so, so, I actually, so in that respect, I thought it was a very interesting conversation to have. Because you know people in the other part of the state think about regionalization. <laughs> well, I, I, I think, but but see, we we've been there, and, and in particular, we were there, we were there um, five to seven years ago, where the state told us that we were going to have to regionalize our schools, and and well, we have seven regional high schools already out there, but they wanted us to and to merge into one super regional school mm -hmm. district. And, and all of a sudden, and, and, the, and the start that off was on the transportation for the, for the schools. And, and, and it, that the, just a school bus contract is not just as easy because we got to what, 70,000 people, but there's the largest, probably the largest county in the state. And all of a sudden they try to, well, now you got kids going to Marhar, Mohawk. Kids to be on the bus that. for two hours each way. Yeah. So they were talking about that. It's already it, it was bad. really it was it was, was it was yeah. but we learned but we learned back then that just because you yeah. want to regionalize schools to doesn't to mean it was a good hours. necessarily a good idea because we were already That's regionalized. A it's a late bus. And a lot of the like cost savings that they were talking about <laughs> our our administrations our school administrations were already were already more progressive in how they were saving money. So it wouldn't have saved money anyway. So and we'd probably end up paying a super superintendent big dollars, and you'd still have to have assistant superintendents and principals, and 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 we, so it was just an interesting conversation to listen to them have, and 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 there again there was a group from Western Mass, and, and I'm not, and we're really central, we're Eastern Western Mass, but we're you know talking with people from, you know, on the New York board or Vermont board or. And they're saying, well, that's not why you regionalize. So, but we know that. So, yep. so it was a good it was a good conference. I thought. Okay. Town administrator updates. Uh, just that next week um, there's probably going to be an ARPA request uh, from school and recreation um, for two thousand dollars to install to be able to raise and lower the basketball hoops. I think. My understanding is we are the only elementary school in the region that has fixed 12 foot hoops. So there was a request. 12 foot. Pardon? 12 foot. 12, 10 foot? 10 foot? I don't, I don't play basketball. Wait, what, what do you. <laughs> I don't know. Is it yards? Right. 50. <laughs> no, it's not yards. I couldn't tell you how tall they are either, Jeff. It's three elephants because we'll use anything but the metric system to measure. <laughs> Um, so that's going to be coming next week, you said? Yes, because they're, uh, they're coming to install new backboards that were already purchased over February vacation, so they would like, if they would like to do this at the same time. Yeah. Makes sense. So. Okay. And they're also replacing the scoreboard, but they are fundraising for that. So they're okay. not going. You were talking about that other day, weren't you, Nathaniel? Yeah. Okay. No, I'm glad to hear that's moving forward. Sat at that scoreboard many a times. Yes, we have. All right. No more? I motion we adjourn. Seconded. Motion made, seconded, adjourn. All those favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 aye.